This episode of The Photographic Eye is brought to you by PicDrop. Be sure to get your free trial by clicking on the link in the description box below. How's it, how's it, guys? As a wedding photographer, God, you, can, you can bump into so many issues. And I wanted to share with you the story today of quite possibly the hardest wedding I have ever photographed because within that whole day encompassed all the issues, all the problems, all the solutions that I keep banging and beating my drum about, about understanding how your camera works, you know, being able to make choices about exposure, things on the fly, being able to understand the technical processes of what it is you're doing and also how to go about actually creating a, a focused project under a lot of pressure and where goalposts keep moving all the time. So around about 2014, I'd been taking photographs, or weddings rather, here in the UK since 2008. And over that time, my, my approach had evolved from the very sort of formal portrait photography that I did in weddings in South Africa through to a more kind of relaxed and, and for want of a better word, a, a documentary kind of style. So Sally and Pierre had reached out to me over email and said, look, you know, we'd like you to photograph our wedding. And normally this would involve me having a chat with them in person. But Sally and Pierre lived in Bali and they were getting married down in Poole, which is near Bournemouth. And so we weren't able to meet up. Now, I, I know Bournemouth a little bit because my gran used to live on the other side of Bournemouth in, in New Milton and thought, OK, well, I, I must go and meet them because I, we have to have a chat in person anyway. So that would be good. I get a chance to know where I'm going, drive off to their house. Their folks got this awesome house down a little private lane meet, have a chat about the day, the awesome, yeah, everything's great, they're lovely at this this point. So next day, got all my stuff ready, it's all lined up, I've, I, I made a point of actually touching all the bits that I needed to make sure I actually had them with me, all the batteries are charged, cards are clean, all sorted. Turn up at the house, go in, start taking photographs. Now at the point, I had taken this this choice of photographing with the album in mind already, the narrative. A couple of photographers who had given me advice on this point said, look, you know, think about chapters in the, in the album, like chapters in a book, that you introduce the, you know, the, you introduce the bride. Where are we? Give us a sense of time. Weave narrative throughout the day. And we're going through that and I'm photographing around and I'm finding little bits in the bobs that's just, you know, help reinforce what's going on. Now, a huge skill at this point is to not be in people's way, to just stand back and say, look, you know, don't worry about me, don't pay any attention to me, you just do your thing. And often that works really well. You know, after a while people stop, they, they ignore you basically, and you just go about your business. But this <laughs> wedding, for some reason, Sally, I think mostly because they had mostly planned all this from Bali, she had this dress that had like a corset tie thing on the back. And I, I was photographing her trying to get into this thing. There. And neither her, her bridesmaid or her dad could figure out how to tie this thing up. <laughs> I sort of say, look, I, because I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an ex-goth and I've hung around people who wear corsets before, I, I know how to tie that. Do you, would you like me to help you? Otherwise, otherwise we're going to be late for the church. So I was like, yeah, so we tied up. So that was one time I kind of I kind of broke through. So at this point, you know, so far so good. It's fairly standard stuff. I'm walking around, taking photographs, being unobtrusive, and, and then I have to drive off to the church. And this is where I'm starting to get into places that are giving me, throwing me little bits of curveballs. What was kind of starting to throw me a little bit was that the church was quite small. And this is where experience of understanding how to measure up sort of what lenses do and, and how to kind of craft a bit of a story and, and again, be unobtrusive, come more into play. Get into the church, it's like, okay, well, I haven't really got space to walk down the aisles. Everything's very cluttered and close in, so I'm going to have to think about what it is that I'm going to do in regards to pictures. I want to get full image. I want to show us where we are, get a, get a sense of the church. It was a very pretty church. Now, because I don't have the, the space to walk around during the ceremony, I have to make a decision. Who am I going to focus on? Is it going to be Sally or is it going to be Pierre? Because of the way that they stand facing each other, 
I can only have one. Often the, the bride is more emotive during the sessions. And also quite a lot of the times it's the bride's family who are, who are paying for the album, if, if you want to be that you know, blunt about it. Ceremony goes through, I get some awesome shots of once they go up into, I don't know, whatever you call it, like a little the chapel bit to go and do a blessing. I was able to get some wider shots, which gets the um, the choir in there. And that was all fantastic. And then, you know, they're, they're out. I'm following them down. I've got more of a wide angle lens going on because I want to get a bit of, oh, what do you call it, energy going on. Right. And I find that with a wide angle lens, I can be a little bit closer. And because of that field of view, it gives me a bit more of a dynamic sort of approach. So, okay, awesome. They're out there, got the wedding. They, they do their thing. They, they have a little sort of get together. Because often this is the first time the bride's seeing anybody. So there's lots of you know, things going on. And I thought, well, this is turning out to be a really cool wedding. You know, what a lovely couple. You know, everybody looks good, is, is energetic. And I didn't know that it was about to get like super, super tricky. That was going to really stretch my abilities as, as a photographer. The photographs that you're seeing on screen are the ones that Sally and Pierre chose for their album. I wish I'd had a service like PicJob to make that whole process so much easier. I could have just created a gallery with the images that I felt were you know, right for the album, and then they could check it out by clicking on the link. They don't have to install any software. They don't have to register anything. And best of all, they can flag the images that they say yes or no, rather than having to write out endless lists. Another great feature that they could have employed was to use the scribble option. So this is fantastic where you could just make some annotated notes on photographs, like, you know, maybe remove this or change that. You can see how much easier that whole process would have been, even though they were back in Bali by the time I actually did the layout for the album. So check out PicJob, you know, give them a try, whether you use photographs for your personal life or, or in, you know, for, for clients. PicDrop is going to help streamline that bridge between you sharing some images and getting some feedback. Click on the link in the description box below for your free trial. At this point, the bride and groom, they drive off and we're all going to a, a stately home called St. Giles Wimborne. The turn up, cool, we're there. What an awesome looking house, a big sort of classic stately home, wonderful drawing rooms. And this is, this is where you get into uh, my first major problem in stately homes. Very few, and I know that they are not set up as wedding venues. So the lighting within them is not supposed to be all bright. It's not a, it's not a conference center. It's windows and maybe some downlighters on the paintings. That, that's kind of your lighting choices, which during the day, it's fine. Actually looks pretty cool because you've got these lovely big windows and they do let in a lot of light. They make the room look great. They throw some pools of shadows in there, all looking fantastic. So yeah, that's, that's cool. I'm getting some action reaction shots. That was a great tip that I had from, from Stephen Taylor when he was teaching me about documentary wedding photography is that when you're looking through that album, remember I talked earlier about narrative, thinking about the story, action reaction. There's somebody looking out the window at the people arriving. I don't need to explain these, this, the progression of the story to you as you're looking at these images because it's there in the photographs. Doing some you know, backgrounds, getting people, they're talking. I think there's some pictures of, of the Duke in there and you know, some canapes, lovely sort of framing, the, 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 the running on hallways and stuff is it, fantastic for weddings. And you know, we, we then off going outside to take some photographs of, of the bride and groom. Oh, again, you know, it's, it's fairly sort of standard stuff. Nothing too hardcore, because that was part of my selling point. It was that people, they wanted a couple of nice natural photographs of them. Let's get some interesting photographs of the bride and groom with the, the house. And if the, the eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that the statue in this fountain looks very similar to the one in Piccadilly. That's because the Statue of Eros is actually, it's not the same statue, obviously it doesn't take a holiday out of the guys, but it was the same family. The family who laid out Piccadilly, they 
are that family who owned St. Giles Wimborne. So they have two of the statues. They have one for themselves and one for, for Piccadilly. Anyway, an interesting sort of side side thing. And these are kind of the cool things you get to, to discover. Do some nice natural stuff. Again, you know, if you want some tips about this, this is just about asking the, you know, the, the Brighton group just to pose. Do their thing. You know, so stand over there, some nice lighting, what have you. Just talk amongst yourself. Talk about when you first met. You know, just you don't worry about me and, and you know, tell a stupid joke or something. And that gives you these wonderful natural expressions. And my timer was running out. My timer was running out because as you've noticed in the background, and I mentioned about the windows, I've mentioned about, you know, the sun and the sun is starting to set. And there's also a lack of light inside. And as I've been walking around, I've gone into where they're going to have their meal, which is in the library. And it's lovely, and I'm kind of, you know, going, but there's something lacking in the library, and that's lights of any description, apart from candles on the table. And I, di I did ask one of the, 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 uh, the people who is like setting up the field, I said, is there any, could be other lights? She said, no, just, they're just going to have candlelight. It's going to be lit by candles. It looks stunning. I'm like, oh, this is, this is handy, <laughs> right? I don't know if you've ever tried to take photographs in an environment where there are just candles, but yeah, Stanley Kubrick did it and he had to fit a whole new lens during Barry Light. And, uh, and I was like, okay, this is going to mean that I'm going to have to photograph quite high eye. So I'm going to have to photograph pretty wide open and I'm going to have to decide how to make an exposure because it's going to have to be manual because I can't rely on my camera to make sense of the candles, the darkness, the people's light, the face, the, the things in the background. None of that is going to be helpful. So I kind of go, right, what am I going to do? What's important here? Firstly, shutter speed. Shutter speed is going to be primary thing. I need to have at a minimum about a hundredth of a second, one twentieth of a second, somewhere in that range. I can obviously handhold slower than that, but I'm dealing with people who aren't on board with this and they're not gonna be sitting still. And I can have slightly underexposed images with sharp-ish people, relatively speaking, or I can just have correctly exposed images and they're all blurry. So I know which one I want. I actually want people to be recognized. <laughs> Right. So that was, so I, I forget what the actual exposure was. And I have a feeling the ISO was probably up around about 12 and a half thousand. So it was, it was, it was quite high. And I did some experiments just before, while the people still having pre-dinner drinks in there with some lighting, uh, just, you know, sort of seeing what I got. And then I set my camera onto manual and I went, okay, bang, I'm done. I need to sample to shoot in raw. Bride and groom come in. Now they warned me about a thing that the French do, because Pierre, as you may have surmised, is, is French. And the French, they wave these, these, uh, these napkins around as, they, as people come in. And so I was like, this is awesome. And I'd been told about how to do this. And this is where, again, that kind of movement thing comes into play. It helped make everything cool. I'd pre, you know, so sort of pre-check that everything was fine. And so I could just focus on having some composition about following the progression of the bride and groom around, of, of getting back into that narrative thing without having to worry about the technical aspect. I know that I'd set my camera for what it was that I wanted and I could just put all that aside, I could park it, boom, and not have to worry. Focus on the thing that mattered. So we did the speeches, they had the meal, it was actually fantastic. I really, I enjoyed it. I did get sore knees because again, it's a very small, uh, it's a very small room where it's very tight. So I had to do a lot of sort of squatting down so I wasn't in people's way, which is also why you end up with this kind of slightly lower down than, than eye level view, which I think makes the whole thing look pretty cool, actually. Because it just, it changes, makes, it gives a bit of a sense of importance. Again, a, a bit of dynamic sort of feel to it. So, you know, we're doing all that sort of stuff. And then later on, they go and they have their first dance in, again, a huge room with a massively high roof. And, and I just, this is where I kind of let back into using flash and things of that nature. Now, the reason I didn't use flash, and somebody no doubt will probably ask this in the comments, during the speeches and the rest of the day, is that 
that makes it feel, for me, unnatural. It makes it feel, for me, obtrusive. And it's not the way that I want to work, especially given that the camera then has a big flash on it and people are going to start paying attention to you. Sally and Pierre had seen my work. They were familiar with other images that looked like I was now creating for them. So they were on board with what they were going to get. That final dance, bit of flash, bit of shutter drag, intentional camera movement, whatever you want to call it. It was all quite nice. Said thank you ever so much to Sally and Pierre. I waved goodbye to St. Giles Wimborne. But that wedding could have gone so badly if I had not understood the basics of all the things that I had, how the lenses work, the, the way that they you know, can, can be employed to make you know, decisions that are going to help you overcome a technical issues. Right? That there are exposures and, and dealing with very difficult lighting conditions and how to overcome that. Because I've, I've been doing this for, for a while that I understand that, you know, that sometimes you have to make comp compromises and I'm not being drawn into overthinking about things to focus on what's important. That narrative that's gone throughout the whole day, what you've been seeing here. If you haven't signed up for the Saturday Selections newsletter, it goes out every Saturday, as you may have guessed, and in there is a weekly dose of inspiration about your photography. Thanks ever so much for watching. Check out this video over here, and I will see you again soon.